individual who's worked in this industry some time helping and supporting leaders. One of the things that uh, I think we've all had to, well, we've all experienced, but certainly had to cope more with in the workplace is, is burnout, particularly given the pandemic and the impact that has had on people and, and indeed, frankly, workplace culture. Um, again, something you referenced in one of your earlier questions, but return to return to the office, return to work. So uh, again, I'd love for you to share some of your thoughts on how you've helped, uh, without naming anyone, but how you've helped leaders manage individual and or team burnout. Um, you know, what are some of the tips, advice sure. you shared with them to help them manage it or overcome it? Sure, sure. Um, this is a, a prevalent problem. This, this is perennial. There's no, there's no two ways about it, and it's quite often hidden because senior leaders, you know, don't want to show too much vulnerability, um, and it can be pretty lonely at the top. And having other people, I, I quite often find that actually, as an executive coach, first ten minutes, a lot of my, um, I just get this download from people because they know it's a safe space, and they just go, boom, this is what's happening in my world. You know, we don't even look at what we're starting to look at. Um, just to understand a bit of context here, I think the important thing is, is in the corporate world and also the VC funded world, etc. Um, there is a big monster there that's insatiable. OK. It's never going to be content with what you feed it. I first learned this by being significantly over target myself once. On the last day of the quarter, still being demanded for more because another part of the business had let somebody down. And I was like, it was it deflated me significantly. Um, I just still took my team to the pub, by the way. I said, didn't I want to get that in the way? <laughs> That's having a good time. Um, but I think you need to realize the context that, that if if that monster is insatiable, um, what are you as the leader going to do about that? Because if you just let that happen come down to you and you just push that then down to your team, you're causing yourself stress and you take. So I really do believe in the power of no. And one of the best examples I heard many years ago with a rapidly growing technology company, um, these sort of senior leaders reporting to the CEO who was changing the business, reorgs, they got new funding, et cetera. And they used to say to him, they had a Monday morning stand up as to what the rhythm of the business was going to be that week. Right. And they came up with this really great way of managing the CEO. They basically say to him, so he'd come up with a huge list like this. And which were all important, by the way, all of these yeah. were valid and important. There was no trivia on there at all. And they said to him, out of all of those important tasks, what is most important? Um, because we out of it's 120 percent of our capacity you've just described. So what's most important that we can have most impact on with the 100 percent of the time and energy us and our teams have now? The CEO certainly didn't like this to start with. You know, this was not an easy conversation. But over time, he realized we we're going to focus on prioritization. We've got 80, 20 things. And these this team eventually became needle shifters in terms of where the business was. But they took ownership of saying what's most important and not just taking it down. So I think that's one for me. Um, skillfully managing our energy. I think time is overrated. I read I read a book many years ago. It's called On Form. Here it is. Here's my copy. You see, I've scrawled all over it. This places an, an emphasis on managing energy more than our time. As human beings, we've got four energy systems, our physical, our emotional, our mental and our spiritual stroke purpose. That's it. That's all we've got. If we skillfully manage our physical time, the quantity of energy we have, if we get emotionally engaged on tasks that mean something to us, if we get mentally focused and not distracted and we're purposeful and we take the time out to find out what we're purposeful about, skillfully manage that. I first learned this when I wrote my book. I was I thought the best way to write a book was the way I'd always been done, which is frankly, you know, industrial. I'll start at nine o'clock in the morning and I'll finish writing it at eight o'clock at night. Yeah. What I realized by reading this book was if I did it in 90 minute sprints, three 90 minute sprints with short 15 minutes in between, I got three times the amount actually written. For less than half the time input, 
So a simple input versus output, you're like, it's a no-brainer. It's a yeah. no-brainer. And we're not working in the industrial age anymore. Yeah. So, so then I would also say then about um, going back to my point about the leader, that the leader needs to understand whom they are and what they are, what's negotiable in their life, what's non-negotiable, um, and have a purpose and stick to it. Um, but you have to lead and you have to over communicate to your team. I think leadership is a bad over communication. Yeah, it's the leader's job. Where does leadership go wrong? It goes wrong when people don't feel involved. Um, so the other things practically that have happened is obviously get close to and stay close to your team. Um, and because it'll, it'll show the direction of how you lead, which will have a multiplied effect. And by the way, there are times people all go through difficult situations. Um, and you've got to make it safe for somebody to say, look, this is happening in my life. There's something happening with my wife, my children. There's something happening with my health. Actually, there's something happening I'm really stuck with. And if you do that, do you know what? You can actually grow together even more. Um, and I would go back to that final piece, which is, you know, don't just lead with task. Um, and I know a wonderful example here of somebody who, of a particular team, that was being very, very driven to achieve a, a tight deadline by a particular day. But this particular leader, who I consider to be one of the most human centric leaders I've ever come across, they took the time out to say, why are we doing this project? Why is it important? Why is it important to the team? And there was a beautiful moment in the team where somebody shared a very personal story about why developing and helping the customers really mattered. Yeah. That team completed that task in something like 30 percent less than before, because collectively they harness their why. Um, to me, sorry, I get goosebumps when I listen to that story. That was going slower, but a very it was better for the business. Customers were better. People were more engaged. Everyone was winning. Everyone was winning. Who was losing in that situation?